Good evening, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends. Welcome to the Embassy of India to this evening of readings and musical reflections on Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And this is an event that drew its inspiration from the gentleman who is standing next to me here, Reverend Nolan Williams, who is a wonderful musician. And we happened to meet just by chance a few months ago at a farewell for a mutual friend. And that was when the idea to uh, commemorate the event, the event being the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. As you know, August 28, 1963, uh, Martin Luther King addressed a gathering of 250 to 300,000 people on the National Mall in Washington. And that's where he gave his I Have a Dream speech. And it was a speech that really turned the tide of history and led to the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and so many other legislations uh, that helped the cause of the African-American population of this country and really brought the country together. And Martin Luther King drew his inspiration, as you know, from Mahatma Gandhi. He was truly inspired and he came to understand Mahatma Gandhi through a set of unique individuals, his teachers at Morehouse College Atlanta, President Benjamin Mays of Morehouse College, uh, Mr. Howard Thurman, and Bayard uh, Rustin, if I'm not mistaken. In fact, President Obama just announced that Bayard Rustin would be given posthumously the Congressional Medal of Freedom in recognition of his contribution to the civil rights movement. In fact, many say he was the, really the uh, inspiring force behind the March on Washington. So we remember all these unique individuals who, may I add, went to India in the, from the 30s and 40s onwards. Martin Luther King went to India after Mahatma Gandhi had died. He went in 1959. He spent a whole month in our country, traveling the length and breadth of our land. But before him, the pioneers were people like Benjamin Mays and Howard Thurman, people who went and met Mahatma Gandhi in, the, in India. In fact, uh, Benjamin Mays, I think, had a 90-minute meeting with Mahatma Gandhi in Mysore in India in 1936, if I'm not mistaken. And he was deeply inspired and impacted by that meeting, and which led him to come back and talk to his African-American brethren about the philosophy of nonviolence and ahimsa. So these are the threads that bind us together, the integrative forces, as I say, that unite people of this country with my country, India. We're two great democracies. We have a great deal in common with each other. And this is, I believe, the spirit that reinforces our strategic partnership today. So we celebrate all these individuals in this evening that we have uh, this concert that we've put together for you today. I would like to specially Welcome, Ms. Soundary David Rodrigo. She is from Sri Lanka, a very dear friend of mine. I used to be ambassador in Sri Lanka at one stage a few years ago, and it was our love of music that brought us together, and it's a friendship that has endured over the years. I wanted to welcome her. She's going to be performing on the piano today. The pieces you will hear will be by Soundary. And um, the voices of inspiration uh, from Reverend Nolan's group. Welcome to all of you. We are greatly looking forward to hearing your musical renditions today. Uh, there will be a few readings from Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, uh, embroidered through the music that you will hear. And, uh, and before I end, I would like to request Reverend Nolan to say a few words, and after which we will commence the evening's uh, music and readings. Thank you. Good evening to everyone. Um, it is a great joy to see everyone uh, here this evening for this auspicious uh, occasion uh, to your excellencies and to especially Her Excellency Ambassador Rao 
um, how thrilled we are uh, to have this partnership. Now, what Ambassador Rao didn't share with you is that not only did this uh, concept start in this residence, in this room, but it really started at that piano. <laughs> um, we were here and we had had one of the finest meals I've ever had in my life. Uh, and Indian cuisine, let me tell you, is just amazing, uh, especially at the ambassador's residence, as you'll see on the back end. Um, and then um, we ended up moving from the dining room to this great room, to the piano, and I ended up being um, called on to play and Ambassador Rao sang, and her son sang and played, and there were other musicians and singers in the room, and it was just a wonderful time of sharing, cross-cultural sharing, and it really laid the seeds for this evening. Isn't that the spirit of how music and art brings us together across all kinds of boundaries? And that really is a great spirit of it. And so in that spirit, we are having not only this celebration tonight, but it is a prelude to a larger celebration that's taking place tomorrow on the National Mall. And I hope by now that all of you have heard all about it and you've already marked your calendars to meet us tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock p.m. at the Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Memorial there in the field adjacent to the memorial. We're going to have an evening of tremendous music called Reflections on Peace from Gandhi to King, where we will further explore this connection, um, not only between India and America, but we have artists from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh, from South Africa, and from the United States. It will truly be a global celebration of peace. And we are really thrilled to have with us representatives of the uh, DC Arts and Humanities Commission in the person of Judith Terra and Lionel Thomas, who are our primary sponsors for that event tomorrow. So we thank you for your sponsorship and for your presence. And we're also grateful to the Embassy of India and especially to uh, Ambassador Rao for their support as well and their sponsorship of this event. Um, so I'm going to get out of the way so that Sandri can come. What an appropriate name, Sound. <laughs> Sandri can come and um, help us experience uh, great music and the sounds of music and the spirit of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King.
a reading from Mahatma Gandhi. I wanted to avoid violence. Nonviolence is the first article of my faith. It is also the last article of my creed. Affection cannot be manufactured or regulated by law. If one has not affection for a person or system, one should be free to give the fullest expression to his disaffection, so long as he does not contemplate, promote, or incite to violence. In my opinion, non-cooperation with evil is as much a duty as is cooperation with good. But in the past, non-cooperation has been deliberately expressed in violence to the evildoer. I am endeavoring to show to my countrymen that violent non-cooperation only multiplies evil and that as evil can only be sustained by violence. Withdrawal of support of evil requires complete abstention from violence. For me, nonviolence is not a mere philosophical principle. It is the rule and the breadth of my life. I know I fail often, sometimes consciously, more often unconsciously. It is a matter not of the intellect, but of the heart. True guidance comes by constant waiting upon God, by utmost humility, self-abnegation, by being ever ready to sacrifice one's self. Its practice requires fearlessness and courage of the highest order. I am painfully aware of my failings, but the light within me is steady and clear. There is no escape for any of us save through truth and nonviolence. I know that war is wrong, is an unmitigated evil. I know too that it has got to go. I firmly believe that freedom won through bloodshed or fraud is no freedom. Would that all the acts alleged against me were found to be wholly indefensible, rather than that by any act of mine, nonviolence was held to be compromised, or that I was ever thought to be in favor of violence or untruth in any shape or form. Not violence, not untruth, but nonviolence. Truth is the law of our being. My soul refuses to be satisfied so long as it is a helpless witness of a single wrong or a single misery. But it is not possible for me, a weak, frail, miserable being to mend every wrong or to hold myself free of blame for all the wrong I see. The spirit in me pulls one way, the flesh in me pulls in the opposite direction. There is freedom from the action of these two forces, but that freedom is attainable only by slow and painful stages. I cannot attain freedom by a mechanical refusal to act but only by intelligent action in a detached manner. This struggle resolves itself into an incessant crucifixion of the flesh so that the spirit may become entirely free. I believe in the message of truth delivered by all the religious teachers of the world, and it is my constant prayer that I may never have a feeling of anger against my traducers, that even if I fall a victim to an assassin's bullet, I may deliver up my soul with the remembrance of God upon my lips.
This is a reading from Dr. Martin Luther King. Our God is able. When we notice the vastness of the cosmic order, we must cry out, our God is able. Each of us faces circumstances in life which compel us to carry heavy burdens or sorrow. Adversity assails us with hurricane force. Glowing sunrises are transformed into darkest night. Our highest hopes are blasted and our noblest dreams are shattered. Come what may, God is able. I would wish you to permit me a personal experience. In India, Mrs. King and I spent a lovely weekend in the state of Kerala, the southernmost point of that vast subcontinent. While there, we visited the beautiful beach on Cape Comorin, which is called Land's End, because this is actually where the land of India comes to an end. Nothing stretches before you except the broad expanse of rolling waters. This beautiful spot is a point at which meet three great bodies of water, the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, and the Bay of Bengal. Seated on a huge rock that slightly protrudes into the ocean, we were enthralled by the vastness of the ocean and its terrifying immensities. As the waves unfolded in almost rhythmic succession and crashed against the base of the rock in which we were seated, an oceanic music brought sweetness to the ear. To the west we saw the magnificent sun, a great cosmic ball of fire, as it appeared to sink into the very ocean itself. Just as it was almost lost from sight, Mrs. King touched me and said, look, Martin, isn't that beautiful? I looked around and saw the moon, another ball of scintillating beauty. As the sun appeared to be sinking into the ocean, the moon appeared to be rising from the ocean. When the sun finally passed completely beyond sight, darkness engulfed the earth, but in the east, the radiant light of the rising moon shone supreme. To my wife, I said, this is an analogy of what often happens in life. We have experiences when the light of day vanishes, leaving us in some dark and desolate midnight, moments when our highest hopes are turned into shambles of despair, or when we are the victims of some tragic injustice and some terrible exploitation. During such moments, our spirits are almost overcome by gloom and despair, and we feel that there is no light anywhere. But ever and again, we look towards the east and discover that there is another light which shines even in the darkness and the spear of frustration is transformed into a shaft of light. This would be an unbearable world where God to have only a single light, but we may be consoled that God has two lights, a light to guide us in the brightness of the day when hopes are fulfilled and circumstances are favorable, and a light that guides us in the darkness of the midnight when we are thwarted and the slumbering giants of gloom and hopelessness rise in our souls. And so we know that God is able to give us the interior resources to face the darkness as well as the light. Let this affirmation be our ringing cry.
This is a brief reading. First, a few lines from Gandhiji's autobiography. It is not my purpose to attempt a real autobiography. I simply want to tell the story of my numerous experiments with truth. And as my life consists of nothing but those experiments, it is true that the story will take the shape of an autobiography. But I shall not mind if every page of it speaks only of my experiments. My experiments in the political field are now known not only to India, but to a certain extent to the civilized world. For me, they have not much value, and the title of Mahatma that they have won for me has therefore even less. Often, the title has deeply pained me, and there is not a moment I can recall when it may have said, may be said to have tickled me. But I should certainly like to narrate my experiments in the spiritual field which are known only to myself and from which I have derived such power as I possess for working in the political field. If the experiments are really spiritual, then there can be no room for self-praise. They can only add to my humility. What I want to achieve what I have been striving and pining to achieve these 30 years is self-realization, to see God face to face, to attain moksha or liberation. I live and move and have my being in pursuit of this goal. All that I do by way of speaking and writing and all my ventures in the political field are directed to this same end. But as I have all along believed that what is possible for one is possible for all, my experiments have not been conducted in the closet but in the open, and I do not think that this fact detracts from their spiritual value. These are some things which are known only to my oneself and one's maker. These are clearly incommunicable. The experiments I am about to relate are not such, but they are spiritual or rather moral, for the essence of religion is morality. My life is one indivisible whole, and all my activities run into one another, and they all have their rise in my insatiable love of mankind. And just a few lines about Gandhiji's worldview, which I think is so appropriate for our century. The better mind of the world desires today not absolutely independent states warring one against another, but a federation of friendly, interdependent states. Interdependence is and ought to be as much the ideal of man as self-sufficiency. Man is a social being. Without interrelation with society, he cannot realize its oneness with the universe. What I want you to understand is the message of Asia. If you want to give a message to the West, it must be the message of love and the message of truth. You will complete the conquest of the West not through vengeance, because you have been exploited, but with real understanding. It is the moral force that governs the universe. We should train for nonviolence with the fullest faith in its limitless possibilities. The better mind of the world desires today not absolutely independent states, but a federation of friendly, interdependent states.
that was Soundary's original composition. She blended in songs that Mahatma Gandhi loved and songs that were associated with Dr. King together into the beautiful medley that you just heard. I'm going to read, and this is the last reading, of excerpts from a radio address that Dr. King gave on the night of his departure from India after his trip. It was an address over All India Radio, and uh, we just found it in the archives of the All India Radio very recently. I thought I would read excerpts from it. Since being in India, I am more convinced than ever before that the method of nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppressed people in their struggle for justice and human dignity. In a real sense, Mahatma Gandhi embodied in his life certain universal principles that are inherent in the moral structure of the universe. And these principles are as inescapable as the law of gravitation. Many years ago, when Abraham Lincoln was shot, and incidentally, he was shot for the same reason that Mahatma Gandhi was shot for, namely for committing the crime of wanting to heal the wounds of a divided nation. And when he was shot, Secretary Stanton stood by the dead body of the great leader and said these words, now he belongs to the ages. And in a real sense, we can say the same thing about Mahatma Gandhi. And even in stronger terms, now he belongs to the ages. And if this age is to survive, it must follow the way of love and nonviolence that he so nobly illustrated in his life. Mahatma Gandhi may well be God's appeal to this generation, a generation drifting again to its doom. And this eternal appeal is in the form of a warning. They that live by the sword shall perish by the sword. We must come to see in the world today that what he taught and his method throughout reveals to us that there is an alternative to violence and that if we fail to follow this, we will perish in our individual and in our collective lives. For in a day when Sputniks and explorers dash through outer space and guided ballistic missiles are carving highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can win a war. Today, we no longer have a choice between violence and nonviolence. It is either nonviolence or non existence. Fifty years ago, before Martin Luther King stood to deliver his uh, famous I Have a Dream speech. Uh, a woman took to the podium who was a friend of Martin's, actually, because they had actually become a great tag team as they had traveled the South, uh, really fighting uh, to bring about a change in this country. And he would speak, she would sing, she would sing, he would speak. I'm thinking of the late, great, legendary Mahalia Jackson. And on that day, she sang a song, How I Got Over. And to embody the spirit of the Harry Jackson, it's your song.
that they would make music together. And so please receive Sandri and the ambassador. flowers bless your way I'll look into your eyes and hold your hand I'll walk beside you through the golden land I'll you through the world tonight beneath the starry skies ablaze with light and in your heart love's tender words I'll hide I'll walk beside you through the I'll walk beside you through the passing years Through days of cloud and sunshine, joy and tears And when the great call comes through sunset gleams I'll walk beside I thought the evening uh, would be incomplete uh, without doing honor to Soundary's mother country, Sri Lanka. And uh, she's going to play a, a very well-known, almost national song in Sri Lanka. His Excellency the Sri Lankan Ambassador will bear me out. Thank you so much for being here today. The song is called Danna Budunge. And there is an India connection with this song also. Of course, the words are in Sinhalese and were composed by a Sinhalese lyricist. But the music was composed by an Indian. Uh, Indian and Sri Lankan musicians worked a great deal together in the early part of the 20th century. So the music for this wonderful, beautiful song, it's one of my favorites, uh, was composed by an Indian. So it's a perfect blend of India and Sri Lanka coming together. Thank you. <laughs>
spiritual, he's got the whole world in his hands. And I think this is a universal spiritual and a universal message. And uh, we want to share this. And then we'll have a wonderful uh, honor of combining our forces here, musical forces, like right after the final scene. <coughs>
Thank you.